All right, so lighting, basics of lighting. What's, uh, can anyone tell me what's the point of lighting? Why do we, why do we have lighting? Yeah, so the camera can see you, right? Um, lighting as an art form uh, began because cameras were not very good at seeing things unless you were sitting out in the bright sun. And so there you go. That's the reason why we have lights. However, what you do with the lights completely depends on the context of why you're shooting, right? So if you're shooting an interview, then the, the point of it is to look interesting in a boring situation, right? You know, like we got a gobo here, which is got a little insert in front of this. This is called a snoop. All right, let me begin with some basic terms. This is a lamp, right? This is a lamp here, even though it's an LED panel lamp. We have a lamp behind here. And then on in front of each of these, we have light modifiers, right? So the lamp generating light. That's its point uh, and purpose. Sometimes they can have different color temperatures. So they can be more blue or they can be more warm. Um, and that's, that's some legacy stuff too. That's because, mm, I don't know, not, not, not that long ago in my world, um, but pretty far long ago for some of y'all, uh, we used to have tungsten lighting which you know, literally was the element tungsten was in the lighting element. It glowed really warm. It was kind of close to candlelight. And then we started getting all these weird different variations like halogen and now everything's pretty much LED. But LED mimics um, either the color temperatures of tungsten lighting. Uh, fluorescent lighting was always kind of in between blue and red, kind of came off as a green cast, had a, had a strange green tint to it, um, and those all have numbers that correspond with them. I, I, if I'm speaking above your head, please let me know. I'm trying to make this very general. Um, but lighting is a very technical thing for turn thing on, make thing glow, right? Um, I mean, that's the basics of, of what light is. And when you're working with lighting, you have direct lighting which is what I'm doing right now. Everything I'm doing right now is a direct light source. So this light is directly hitting him. This light, directly, directly, right? If I wanna do bounce light, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this, turn that off. I'm gonna turn. I don't own these lights, so sometimes I have to figure out things on the fly waking up. So, <laughs> yeah, striking. So as you can see, that's a bounce light, right? So I'm shooting light up into the ceiling. That's creating a nice, soft, uh, diffused light. Um, so the light source is there, but the light that's hitting him is coming from up there. Uh, this is a light meter. Uh, I may discuss how to use a light meter in a minute. Um, most of these things have some sort of diffusion on there, right? So direct light, th light moves in straight lines. If you have a grid, has more straight lines, right? If you have diffusion, diffusion spreading the light out, it's making it soft. If I were to use, well, this is a good example. Um, I'm going to turn this off so that we can see it. This light is, is a lot more sourcey. That's why we're seeing the shadows. See, look how sharp my shadow is against the, the background here, right? That's not diffuse. That's a focused light. It's, it's more like a spot. So when we're talking about diffusion, we're spreading the light out. We're making it wider. The, instead of going in straight lines, we're kind of bending the light to go out and fill the room. When we are using a more directed source, we're spotting it is what's called, right? If you use a Fresnel, which is a, we don't have a Fresnel on any of these, but it's a glass instrument that can be used to focus light. So the further it gets away from the, the lamp source, the, 
It depends on which way uh, the lens faces, but typically it becomes more spotted and then as it gets closer, it spreads out. So whenever you're talking about lighting, you want to think, am I bouncing the light? If I'm bouncing the light, what does the white tiles that are up there, maybe they're not a full white, maybe they're kind of an off white and I'm using a blue light. So that's going to create a color change, right? So bounce light, whatever you're bouncing off of is going to create a, a character to the light, a color to the light. The diffusion, the way diffusion is made and how much diffusion you use affects how it, it works. So like this diffusion, as you see here, there's kind of like this grid pattern in it. So that's going to create a certain kind of diffuse light. It's very technical, but um, if, if you notice this, and maybe we'll, you can get up and walk over here. This one does not have the same kind of grid pattern. So this diffusion is creating a different kind of character to how the light gets spread. I feel like I'm jumping around. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the kookalores, cookie, gobo, those are all terms that are used interchangeably. Uh, like what she's talking about, kookalores, is technically, it's the shape that you put in front of the light that's creating the shadow. So there, there's a bunch of different, uh, he has a bunch of different versions of that. Um, the reason why there's all these different names is because are you an East Coast filmmaker or a West Coast filmmaker? Um, or you're a Texas filmmaker? You know, like you could call it a triple nipple grubbler. And that makes as much technical sense as Kukaloris or, or Gobo, right? It's just what someone goes, hand me that whatchamacallit to put in front of the lens. But typically it's anything that you fly in front of the light to create a shadow to create interest in an uninteresting setting. Um, you can use that to, uh, in old noir films, um, particularly gets used a lot because they had no money for sets. So they would turn all the lights off and then they would have this kind of backlighting scene to create silhouettes and then they would just shoot little slashes of light kind of like that to create a scene, right? Like a moonlit uh, office scene or um, any other high contrast situation so that that way they didn't have to pay for a lot of set dressing, right? Um, a lot of times people will cut branches off of trees and stick it in front of the light so that it waves and you get that playing light pattern. Um, that's also a kookaloris or a gobo or whatever. Um, let's see, where, where else can I go with this? Yeah, cardboard. I've also used uh, black wrap uh, and cut slits into it. You, uh, you can actually go get actual windows and park them in front of things. Um, the, the point of that is just to be creative. It's, it's just to do something different. It comes in and out of style. In the 80s, everything had a gobo on it. If, it was, if there was an interview, there was a lead, uh, red slash and then a blue slash and it you know, just looked like someone threw up with crayons. Um, and then that all went away because that was just poo-poo and, and not sophisticated enough. And now we have everything has to be a dark side toward camera and it has to be side lit and all, all the things that now when we think of the style of lighting that is because that feels more cinematic. But personally, I have, I have an argument with the idea of cinematic lighting. Cinematic lighting is however it needs to be to tell the story, right? If, if I'm doing a, a setting where, where I'm telling a story and not just I'm illuminating a subject and so I'm making him uh, appear interesting because I'm going to stare at him for an hour, right? This, this is three-point lighting. I got a key light, 
I've got a backlight, you know, it's kind of working as this hair light, as you can see here, you know, this is what's going on here. And then this is kind of an accent light or a kicker, right? Normally the kicker goes on the dark side. Um, so our, our backlight is also functioning as our kicker. You can also, you could in theory have a low light shooting up to, to do some uh, glow across the shoulder. We could move this directly overhead, right? It, it's, that's all for whatever you need uh, for an interview. But if I'm telling a story and the story calls for someone being in a laundromat, there is no cinematic style for being in a laundromat. It's do I want the person to feel like they're in a laundromat or do I want them to feel like they're in a laundromat with a soap opera approach? You know, I can, I can not light a scene and I can just let the light play out through the windows in a place and park the person in just the right spot. That's lighting, right? That's taking the room and it's taking the subject and placing them interestingly in composition. So all these lamps and stuff like that, the reason why we have them is because the sun moves. So if I need to shoot a scene and I'm gonna do a close up, a wide shot, I'm gonna do some inserts, I'm gonna do all these kinds of things that take time, you know, like say an hour per setup. I don't, want to, I don't want the sun to change position constantly in between shots, right? So I set up one of these to replace the sun in that scenario so that I can have uh, a consistent lighting pattern over the course of six to eight shots, whatever it takes to, to build a scene. So when you're thinking about lighting, it's all about how long is this scene gonna play out? If I have multiple cameras and I can park them in places where they're not casting shadows and I can shoot an entire scene as it's going to play on screen in less than an hour, I probably don't need to set up lights. I can probably just use whatever available lighting is and just be mindful about what's going on. But let's say it's a very complicated fight scene that takes place over the course of two days and it always has to look like sunset. Well, that's, that's impossible. Uh, so you would have to set up a lighting scenario that reflects where your sun is in your virtual world, and you begin to design your lighting scene for that, right? Um, and all of what I just talked about doesn't involve what lamp you're gonna use. It's all about planning for what the story needs, right? Because sometimes I have lit a project with just one of these and I was able to use whatever was in available. There was fluorescent lighting. Uh, this is a bounce, right? You know, you got a silver side, you got a gold side. Um, they're all pretty standard stuff. Uh, but you know, like a scene in Black Panther, uh, you know, a giant billion dollar Marvel movie and they're lighting Chadwick Boseman with a piece of foam core out, you know, out in the sun, right? So it's, the tool that you use to get the job done is not about, it has nothing to do with um, expense. It just has to do with technically what do I need to accomplish the job. Yeah, that's, that's my spill about cinematic lighting, right? Long and short of it is cinematic lighting is whatever it takes to tell the story. So when people say like, is this cinematic lighting? I mean, I would call this untold mystery lighting because this is what it reminds me of is untold mystery TV shows. You know, he's telling me about how aliens crawl out of his butt at night. And, you know, I'm sorry. It's okay. really, you know. No, listen, I, I mean, I did. I just was hoping you would keep that. <coughs> I, I, it just came out. I'm sorry. Um, you know, or, or, you know, how the, the Maltese Falcon was stolen in 1962, which it was, I think that film is older than that, but. Um, so I, I would call this mystery light, mystery show lighting, especially with the, the Kukuloris in the background. Yeah, I, I feel pretty good. History Channel show. Um, now, a lot of times, probably, uh, how do I want to accomplish this? Oh, here we go. 
One second. Pardon me while I make an adjustment here. I'm gonna do a bounce off of this white electrical panel door. Rhodes, I'm trying not to destroy your light. It's like I wasn't even questioning it until you just said that. Striking. I'm going to kill this. So now what this is, is I'm lighting the close side of the face. Let's go ahead and continue. You're going to look here. So I'm the producer that's having the conversation with them. The w other way I had them lit, yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't call it that. So yeah, so in other words, lens, right, camera, side of the face. This is the close side of the face to the lens. So I'm lighting the, the side of the face that's closer to the lens. Previously, I'd been lighting the side of the face away from the lens. Right. Um, Ridley Scott kind of championed that far side light. And the idea is that it's because you got a silhouette, right? It's supposed to create more interest. What, what are their, the character is in mystery. Um, they, you don't really know what they're thinking about, what, what's going on in their mind, right? Um, it was also a way for him to save money on lighting because it was only two-point lighting, right? So a lot of choices that get made in lighting has to do with like, well, if I get one more light off that truck, it's going to cost me another $150 for the day. Let's keep that light on the truck and figure out how I'm going to do this, you know, um, in, in cinema. Uh, Walter Murch. Uh, no, not Walter Munch. I'm thinking it wrong. Uh, guy that did Skyfall, the DP. Roger Richard, Deakins. yeah, Roger Deakins. Used to chat with him on online forums, and he would trash red cameras, and I would talk mad, mad smack about how Ari sucked, right? <laughs> um, I'm a nobody. He was just that cool to kind of participate on the forums, right? And he treated me like a professional. So he's, he's a top-notch dude. Uh, but the way he lights is he puts these old tungsten lights on the floor, lines up uh, um, sheets of um, foam core, and then puts muslin cloth over it and shoots into that. And it creates this beautiful glowing look. And it's kind of what's 360 degree lighting, right? That's, that's one of his favorite. It's called cove lighting is the, is the technical term that he came up with. Um, so he's using a bounce light, something I'm doing right here. It kind of doesn't look great. I'm not super excited. It's not, it doesn't feel very artsy, right? But it's getting the job done. I'm seeing his face. You know, this feels a lot more newsy. The other one felt a lot more TV showy, right? Um, but it's the same technique. Instead of bouncing it from up here, Too bright for you, bud. Is that a little better? Oh, no, I just, I've got things so many times about it. Yeah, I, just I was keeping it pointed away, I, I promise. I wasn't trying to hit you. So if you notice the quality of it feels different, right? Um, it, it's, it's just the difference of up here feels a certain way, down here feels a certain way. Which way is better? Whatever calls for the story. Yeah, exactly. I liked it up. You liked it up? I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting back to more unsolved mysteries. So I'm going to go back up here. And. We're going to go, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off and go back to the original kind of setup here. See, we're, we're, and if I turn this head off back here,
this is even a different look, right? Like, it's not as interesting. Um, truth is, that light in the back is probably a little too hot when I turn it back on. This shouldn't go to, to white. It should kind of maintain some kind of skin tone. That's color temperature. Where's the dimmer on this? Yeah, this is the dimmer. Okay. There you go. That's cool. So that's a that's a lot more subtle use of that light. It, I'd, I'd probably bump it up a little bit more because I, I like a little bit more shine going on in the, in the dark side of the face. But, you know, that's that's another level of. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's play with the. So another thing you can think of is right now we have kind of an active fill. You can also use negative fill. So. No matter what, this white wall over here is casting some, some light back. It's bouncing some light back. So look at how much more dramatic it becomes now that I have this negative fill on his face. Can you see it? I can't see what, what it's doing. So that's without. And that's with. Yeah, negative fill is always subtle. Um, negative fill, best place to use negative fill is outside. So we like this contrasty <laughs> shape look that we have going on, um, but how do you do that in bright sun? You bring in a black solid. Normally duvetine, I recommend duvetine over black foam core. Black foam core kind of has a sheen to it. Black duvetine, which is a velvet, uh, you know, you would use it to make an Elvis painting or something like that if you wanted. Um, yes? Do you mean that different materials give different <laughs> reflections? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So, um, for instance, this is a 5 and one that Rhodes lent me. So you, you have this shiny side right there, and that kind of creates a different character to um, bounce light. Like, let's, let's do that. So this is shiny silver kind of going on, right? If I used a faded cloth, I mean, even my shirt, I'm going to get uncomfortably close. Don't worry. <laughs> this is doing some reflecting, right? <laughs> So one of the things that's kind of cool is like if you have a really moody scene um, and you have a very strong directional light, like, like if instead of having a kookaloris, if I was pointing it at him and I aim the light and it bounced right off of here like in a Rembrandt lighting, it reflects up into the eye, right? So, I mean, my hand is enough to make a difference. The cloth that I'm wearing, I mean, not only do, uh, do our sensors see light differently off of different materials, particularly like if you're wearing black clothes on camera under certain lights, you could have a black sports coat, looks brown. You could have a black t-shirt and it looks kind of reddish. And then you could have black pants that look kind of green. And that has to do with like, is there rayon? Is it cotton? Um, is it uh, a poly blend? So everything in your frame affects how light gets treated, refracted, um, where this particularly, oh, haze. I could have brought some haze in. Another way you can diffuse light is by adding particulates to the air, dust, right? Um, a lot of people confuse haze and fogging machines. Fogging machines are for outside because it produces a very thick material that kind of rides the ground. Uh, normally dry ice is involved. 
and in fog looks great in a dark scene. Inside of a building though, you wanna use something called haze. And haze is a little bit more transparent. It just breaks up the light. It's like, it makes everything kind of milky as if you uh, haven't put your LUT on your, on your film uh, or on your digital file. Um, I mean, let's, let, I don't want to get into the color science of lens. Well, like that you kind. Take the and the to yeah, exactly. You, you know, sunbeams picked it up. yeah, or sunbeams. But, um, yeah, where was I thinking? Oh, yeah. So let's, uh, yeah, great, great idea. So let's say you want kind of the shafts of light coming into the room because you're in a, a canyon or uh, something like that. You would want to fill the space up with plenty of haze or maybe fo fog in that situation. There are different mixtures and different materials. Um, some, there are what I would call more herbal varieties that use like eucalyptus and other things. Um, but you want to be careful about what you use to be able to create those particulates because people have strong reactions. Particularly actors don't like a whole lot of that stuff in the air. It looks great on camera. I love the way it looks, but you know, they start getting stuffy and then they're getting tongue tied because they're getting snot running down the back of their throat. Um, you breathe that stuff all day long, you get a sore throat. Uh, so it's, that's also something to take in consideration when you're using some of these things. How is it going to affect your talent? Like if you're using a lot of hot lights and maybe they're a person that perspires a lot, um, that's something you need to take in consideration. Lighting is always to serve the story and should serve the talent. Does the size of the light matter? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a reason why I own this giant one piece of light. If we look into his eyes, you can see the shape. Let me focus. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. So you can see the shape of the implement. So if I use a round implement, and this is just eye reflection, this is a whole nother science. Like there, there, sometimes you will put a light next to your lens on the camera just to get a little eye re reflection, right? Um, and it's not very bright. It's normally like a little pointy, small light that, that just puts a little catch light in the eye so that people look alive, right? Um, because if there's no light, they look like sharks. They look like murderers. They get, you know, so, so that's, that's a way to kind of dehumanize your character as well as maybe we don't want any catch lights in their eyes. So when you're looking at lighting, you're always looking to support your talent. You're looking to support the story and you're looking to support the storytelling function. But back to different light sizes and shapes. Pretty common. Nowadays, to see these giant uh, octodomes, right, eight-sided, and this one's more like 20-sided. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have, uh, he's got some square ones in the back there, some small domes, some deeper domes. The, the depth of your light modifier affects how the light gets bounced around and shaped coming out. Um, mostly shapes come into play with eye, eye lights. That's where you really see it. But t a lot of cinema cameras or, or cinema setups are large sources far away from talent. And by large, I mean like they may have a 16 foot source that has two lights shining through it. You, oh. Do I have another battery? I don't have another Sony battery with me. Huh? Yeah. Do you have a Sony battery? You got one? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think about other. Pardon us for this momentary computer works. Yeah. Just make sure I get that back to you before I leave. 
What drives your choices for light modifiers? I mean, at our level, it's what do you have available? So if all you have is a ring light, then you figure out how to rock that ring light. Uh, a, a, you could bounce a ring light off of something and now it's not the ring shape that, that's hitting them, it's whatever you're bouncing the light off of. Um, if you have something like this, then this is what you use. You back it away from the talent, you move it in closer. It, that's totally up to you. Domes and, and stuff like that are typically used. <coughs> they originally came from the photo world, right? Um, I've also worked on sets where we were lighting um, a, a fake kitchen. And we had the lights were all mounted on a grid, and they didn't have these fancy diffusers. What we did is we would cut foam core into cones and then fold it around and tape off one side and then mounted that to the light. And that's how we created a light modifier. And then we used something called uh, opal diffusion. So you can buy material that you can trim off. It's called a consumable. Um, you can buy gels to color lights, although that's becoming less important because nowadays you just use colored LEDs. Um, the reason why you wouldn't do colored LEDs, though, is a colored LED may not reproduce exactly the right color on the chip of your camera. So you may still end up have orange in particular is a weird uh, lighting color. So if you're doing, say, a Clemson shoot and you want orange, you may want to get a orange filter for your light to get it close to the right color as opposed to an LED. Um, sometimes LEDs can read, an orange LED could read it kind of a red or a yellow, depending on how the, the wavelength coming off the LED looks. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so now that, that brings us to another thing, color correction in lighting. Um, before I spoke about color temperature, the sun is considered roughly 5,600, right? Uh, if you measure the sun color temperature uh, in the general blue sky, if you're doing a, uh, if you're on a cloudy day, that typically is closer to 6,000 in color temperature. If you're doing a candlelight, that's around 2,800 in color temperature. So those kind of give you ranges of what those color temperatures are. Now, when you're using lighting implements, um, original LEDs had a weird magenta cast to them because they had what was called a green spike in the color spectrum. So if you're using like original one by one panels, you would have to put a magenta filter to correct it back to white. Um, nowadays, that's, that's no longer a problem. Most LEDs, even the cheap ones, are pretty color accurate around the uh, 55K mark or the 28 or 32K mark, which is the warmer side. But you also may need to use plus green, which is, a, it, it literally is a, a green filter that is just a percentage of difference. And that takes out, typically if you put a filter in front of a light, the color of the filter is blocking other wavelengths but that color. So it would, it would allow, but a color correction <laughs> filter allows all light except for the color that it's correcting for. It's counterintuitive. Normally you put a red filter and the light turns red, but when you do a color correction filter, it's blocking the particular color um, that it is, right? That's a very technical thing. It get, it, that is a minutia level lighting correction that you're doing. Um, most of us probably won't see it because how many of you are shooting on auto white balance? I don't know. I, sh I don't, but um, that's because I'm a professional. But <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So um, I'm actually glad that you were talking about color because whenever it comes to costume designers and whatnot, I know in theater, 
if you don't have your like set designer talking to you or like your light designer talking to your costume designer there's moments where the set and the costume can clash Mm -hmm. so can you speak to that like like in like a film sense like are there times where you talk to like a wardrobe designer oh yeah like I, i mean all right and makeup definitely makeup because like say you're shooting black and white if you're shooting black and white you are not doing traditional makeup you're doing um like soft palette colors like magentas and and stuff like that to create contrast and cool colors um for instance if you look up the set design for uh wandavision where it was filmed in black and white they painted the wall colors, these weird, um, uh, um, like magenta, uh, a cool cyan blue, and on camera in black and white, it reads as darker or lighter tones, right? Um, So black and white requires a completely different color palette than you would expect to be able to get the, the color tones to play out. And the only way you would know that is if you did any kind of study on old black and white TV shows, that's the kind of tricks that they would use to get people to look good on camera for those, right? Um, so that, that, that's a use case scenario to pay attention to your makeup and the style of presentation. If you're shooting infrared, um, like in Dune 2, there's the whole Harkonnen battle scene with Asa Butler and wh- whoever he kills in that fight. Um, they shot that with infrared. So with infrared, your skin exposes completely different because the light is bouncing from deeper in uh, the cellular tissue. So if you have sun damage, it shows up differently. It exposes differently. If you're shooting in a UV spectrum, that also is a, is a concern. So what? long story short, if you're going to do something out of the ordinary, um, always do a camera test, right? Um, if you're doing, if you're going to put people in front of camera, you're going to spend time day of shooting something. What does it cost you to, nowadays, it's not like I'm burning film to see what I'm doing. I need to know what it's going to look like. So I would have your costumer and you and whatever camera you're shooting on with whatever LUT that you're processing with, right? Like if you're gonna use a LUT, um, what, whatever it is you're gonna do, and you look at it all with the kind of lights that you're gonna be shooting with, right? Because different lights, different light manufacturers, like this, we have a small rig, we have an AMRAM, this is a, these LEDs are from, um, I can't remember the name of the company, but they get, even within the brand, will have variations on how the light interacts with certain things. Um, So you may get two lights from the same manufacturer, but one light is slightly bluer at the same setting that the other one is slightly redder in, right? So always kind of, if it's important to you, like if you're really paying attention to that kind of stuff, it behooves you to do a camera test with uh, clothing materials, because like I said, different blacks will come out differently. Um, Sometimes you can use filtration on the lens to counteract for that. Sometimes you can't, right? Polyester, the way it holds light, the way it refracts light, it just comes out brown sometimes on camera and you just can't, won't be able to figure it out. Um, Lens flaring and, and shooting with anamorphics. You, the way your lights interact with how your lens perceives them, you know, whether or not you have, let's take mine. I don't know if it's gonna flare, not so much. But one of the reasons why I like this lens is when I point it towards the sunlight, I get a beautiful lens flare, right? Uh, That's kind of a thing, I I don't know, maybe that's going away. Uh, We're all kind of tired of um, J.J. Abrams, too much lens flare, Uh, but, yeah, it might work. Yeah, it's a little, yeah, there you go. It's kind of, you're, you're getting the streaking there. This is not an anamorphic lens. But if you're shooting with an anamorphic lens, um, 
and you're shooting with a historic anamorphic lens, like a Cook, um, from way back in the day, you may want to consider using tungsten lights instead of LED lights. It adds more power budget. You know, there, there's other reasons to or not to use um, certain light things. Like, I love a tungsten light. I like shooting a 1K against a piece of pure white foam core set up on a C-stand so that it bounces the light. The heat from tungsten light makes um, people's skin flush and a flush skin, like not, not super ruddy, but it just adds a little kiss of health to, to certain faces, right? Um, time? Five minutes? All right. So, um, but I use that for uh, an entire documentary setup. Like that, that was kind of like my jam for a while, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, basic three-point lighting, uh, like like what I have here, you, you've got to side this, you know, and then some kind of a, an accent or um, a taste light, but really it comes down to what is your style? Um, are, you know, is, what is the subject? matter about like if you want to get deep into that does it need to feel lit or does it need to feel like you happened upon the scene and you're asking questions right it, it's all about your approach um, in documentaries like um, I've, I've had situations where I'm running in and out of buildings in New York City and uh, my lighting kit, my camera kit, it's just me, and I've got to light a, an office that's, you know, like a quarter of the size. That determines what I'm going to be able to do a, a great deal. And back then, if you want any kind of depth of field, you know, soft, blurry stuff, you would have to have the camera all the way against that wall and zoomed all the way in to kind of get that look. So um, I was all about being efficient in that scenario. Right, small bags, small lights, you know. But if you have a good sized crew and they're going to be able to set things up for you, then you know you can expand it a little bit. Yeah. Sorry, I, it, that's not a very. No, it's okay. I'm going to dig a little deeper. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd love to answer your questions. Um, feel free to reach out to me on Facebook or Instagram. I would love to help you out. And uh, you can find me at Trinity Greer Illustrates. Is my art Instagram, uh, um, the other stuff uh, is film or, or yoga related, so try not to mix them up too much. Uh, yeah, thank you all so much for letting me talk to you about it.